Okay, I'm told that it's, uh, it's time to begin. So, I will do so. And again, it's a pleasure to be here and be able to talk to you about the subject that we're all interested in, namely memory. Now, one of the reasons why many of us find memory so interesting is that it's not a perfect record of what happened to us. Memory is subject to various kinds of errors and distortions that on the one hand have important implications for everyday life and on the other hand can teach us a lot about the way that memory works. And so I'm going to be talking about focusing on memory errors today and I just want to start off with a few different examples, uh, a couple of which may be familiar to people. So shown here is uh, probably the most famous patient in the history of neuropsychology, Henry Malayasin, known in the literature as patient HM. And of course, as probably almost everybody here knows, back in the 1950s, HM is a, a young man suffering from epilepsy, had an operation to remove the medial temporal lobes bilaterally uh, that left him virtually unable to remember his day-to-day -day experiences. His cognitive function was normal or near normal in many ways, but he simply could not hold on to information about what was happening to him over time, and it quickly faded. And from that, we as a field over the last 50 years uh, have learned a lot about the role of the medial temporal lobes and various aspects of memory, the pioneering observations of HM in the famous paper by Scoville and Milner really spurred a whole generation's worth of, of research uh, that's continuing, uh, continuing today. Um, I want to turn next to another kind of forgetting. It's not something as well known as HM and certainly has not been influential in our field, but it's kind of a fun example of different ways that memory can, can uh, lead us astray. Back in 2009, there was an attempted bank robbery in New Zealand. The man shown in the picture here was trying to rob a bank with a partner of his. However, there were two problems. Number one, he forgot to put on his mask. So he had sunglasses on, but he forgot his mask. Uh, he also was supposed to have a gun. He forgot his gun. So when you want to commit a robbery and you forget your mask and you forget your gun, you've got a problem. So he, was, he and his buddy were put in jail and it was written up in the New Zealand Herald on June 18, 2009. Uh, two men have had a night in the cells to reflect on the importance of planning after one of them forgot his mask and gun while allegedly attempting an armed holdup. So memory got gotten the way there. Third example is one that will be familiar to, probably to some of the North Americans, uh, no doubt to the North Americans in the room and uh, possibly to some others. Uh, what I'm showing here on the slide, the picture of that uh, uh, bombed out building was a federal office building in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And as many of you will know, back in 1995, uh, that building was uh, bombed in a domestic terrorist attack and shown here in the top picture is uh, an individual, Timothy McVeigh, who was ultimately arrested and convicted and executed for his role in that horrific bombing back in April uh, 1995. Um, what a few of you may remember is that in the days and weeks after the Oklahoma City bombing, in the U.S. there was a nationwide manhunt for two individuals before it was known who Timothy McVeigh was. And they were called John Doe number one and John Doe number two. And these were people were, who were thought to be involved in the bombing. And John Doe number one turned out to be McVeigh. John Doe number two, shown in this artist sketch, based on an eye, uh, the eye, eyewitness memory of someone who had seen uh, McVeigh claimed to have seen him with this guy. Uh, he was referred to as John Doe number two. But John Doe number two could never be found, at least not found as a participant in the case. Uh, but ultimately it became clear what had happened, and what had happened was a very interesting error of human memory. Uh, the reason why 
uh, this sketch existed is that there was a guy by the name of Tom Kensinger who went to the body shop where Timothy McVeigh rented the van that he used to carry out the bombing. And he had this vivid memory that it wasn't just McVeigh, but McVeigh was there with this other guy who had a, a, a cap on and he had a tattoo and other identifying features and he described him in great detail and he said the two of them were there together at the body shop. Well, after some uh, detective work, the FBI ultimately figured out that this, the guy shown in this picture was at the body shop where McVeigh rented the van to carry out the bombing, but it was the, he was there the next day, the day after McVeigh was there, with somebody who looked like McVeigh. And the witness, Tom Kensinger, had kind of uh, miscombined these two elements of his experience and combined them into a false memory. And that's what was concluded in the final report of the Oklahoma County uh, Grand Jury back in December 1998, and they stated, we believe that the most likely identity of John Doe number two was that of Todd Bunting. He was an innocent man who I showed you before, a private in the U.S. Army, who, was with, Michael, um, who with Michael Hertig was in uh, Elliott's body shop on April 19, uh, 1985, the day after McVeigh was there. Similarity of Mr. Hertig to the composite of John Doe number one, he looked a lot like McVeigh, the guy that Bunting was with, and the similarity of Todd Bunting to the composite of John Doe number two are remarkable, particularly when you take into account Mr. Bun Bunting's tattoo of a Playboy bunny on his upper left arm. So the guy who was there had a tattoo on his left arm that the witness remembered correctly, and that he was wearing a black t-shirt and a Carolina uh, Panthers ball cap. So all these details about what the guy looked like were right, but he wasn't there with McVeigh. So, these different kinds of errors, uh, examples of errors, illustrate that there are a lot of ways in which memory can lead us astray. Back around 15 years ago or a little bit more, I had just started in my lab working on memory errors and memory distortions, and it occurred to me in looking over the literature that although um, it was clear to everyone, uh, going back to the historic studies of Ebbinghaus and Bartlett that memory uh, was prone to error, nobody had really tried to systematically organize the literature and to categorize different kinds of, of memory errors. And so I set that out as a, a task and came up with the idea that there are seven fundamental categories of memory errors. And by analogy with the ancient uh, biblical deadly sins, the seven deadly sins, I refer to them as the seven sins of memory, uh, wrote about that first in an article in the American Psychologist in 1999, and then in a, bo a book titled The Seven Sins of Memory in 2001. So what are the seven sins? Well, the first three are what I call sins of commission, uh, sins of omission. Uh, and sorry, the, the dark uh, print doesn't show up too well in this room. These are three different kinds of forgetting. So the first kind, you can't really see it, it says transience. And transience refers to the fact that all other things being equal, memories become decreasingly accessible over time. We all know that. All other things being equal, it's harder to remember what happened to you on a given day five years ago than on a given day uh, a week ago. Um, and that is the kind of forgetting that was exacerbated in the case of HM. His memory was extremely transient. His memories faded very, very quickly. Second kind of forgetting that I talked about I, def I, I call absent-mindedness, um, and that refers to lapses of attention that refer to, that involve forgetting to do things. So that would be exemplified by the failed uh, bank robbery in New Zealand. Uh, if you had asked that bank robber, do you remember that you wanted to bring a gun and a mask to the robbery? He probably would have remembered that. It wasn't a case of the information fading out of his mind, as it would be with uh, transients. Uh, rather, there's a breakdown at the interface of attention and memory, and he committed an absent-minded memory uh, error, not attending to memory at a time when he needed to, and thereby forgetting both his mask and his gun. Uh, the third kind of forgetting I refer to as blocking, and that's the temporary in inaccessibility of stored information. So that's, for example, a tip of the tongue state. When we know that information is in memory, we're trying to remember it, we may be heavily cued to remember it, but we block on the information at the moment, we can't come up with it uh, at the time we want it. 
I also talked about four different sins of commission. These are, these are cases where memory is present, but it's wrong. Uh, the, f- the first one, uh, again, sorry, the red type doesn't show up here. Uh, the first one I refer to as misattribution, and that occurs when we attribute memories to an incorrect source, often resulting in a phenomenon known as false recognition. Obviously, that w- that's what was going on, the memory sin involved in the Oklahoma City bombing incident. Tom Kessinger remembered correctly what Timothy McVeigh looked like, he remembered correctly what the other guy, Todd Bunting, looked like, but he misattributed his memory of Bunting to the episode uh, where he had seen McVeigh. He put those two things together incorrectly, and we're gonna be focusing on misattribution for most of this talk. The other memory distortion sins are suggestibility, that refers to implanted memories. We know a lot about that through the work of Elizabeth Loftus and many others. Uh, there's also the memory sin of bias that refers to memory uh, retrospective distortions produced by current knowledge and beliefs. That's a very p- pervasive, though more subtle uh, memory error where what we currently know, believe, and feel skews and distorts our memory of past experiences. And then finally, I also talked about uh, what I call the sin of persistence, which are unwanted recollections that people are, cannot forget. Typically, after emotionally disturbing or arousing experiences, we may be overwhelmed by uh, intrusive memories. So these are seven different ways in which memory can go awry. Um, it would be nice if um, what I could do today is kind of update you on all the progress that's been made on each of the seven sins since I wrote that book back in 2001. I don't think Professor Oprah would give me that much time to do a good job on that. We'd be here all day. So I'm going to focus instead on just one of the memory sins. It's the one I find actually probably the most interesting, and it's one we've worked on uh, in my lab, and it's one in which there have been some pretty interesting developments, I think, over the last 15 years. And this is the memory sin of misattribution, attributing memories to uh, an incorrect source. And there are going to be three major parts to the talk. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about misattribution and the brain with respect to the issue of distinguishing true versus false memories using neuroimaging techniques, something that we and others have worked on. Second, I'll talk about a related topic about misattribution and how that relates to uh, the process of reactivating memory and show you some recent evidence that the way in which you reactivate a memory for past experience can actually promote misattribution errors. And then third, I'm going to talk about misattribution and adaptive memory processes. As we'll see later, one of the main arguments in the Seven Sins book was that, although I call them sins, you can think of these so-called sins not so much as flaws or defects in memory, but prices we pay for adaptive features of memory that make the system work well most of the time. So I'll briefly talk about that idea, some recent perspectives on that, and then some very recent uh, new as yet unpublished data uh, that relate to that issue. Okay, so let's talk about uh, misattribution in the brain. One of the reasons why the question of distinguishing true from false memories has, is not only of theoretical interest, but is also uh, important for real world concerns, uh, has to do with the fact that eyewitness memory errors of the kind that we talked about with the Oklahoma City bombing case, uh, are, that's not a unique case. Those kinds of errors happen a lot and they often result in uh, wrongful convictions of people who are sent to jail for crimes that they didn't commit. And One of the ways we know that is through the work of the Innocence Project, uh, which has analyzed factors leading to wrongful uh, convictions in cases where people have been exonerated of the crime on the basis of DNA evidence. And what this figure shows is from the first uh, 130 exonerations is that in about 75% of these cases, mistaken eyewitness identifications, often uh, involving memory misattribution errors, uh, are, are very prominent. So about 75% of the time when somebody is exonerated for a crime that they didn't commit on the basis of DNA evidence, it turns out that there was a memory error that was part of the reason why they got put in jail. 
Uh, and that's been updated to over 250 cases, and I think it's over 300 now. But for those who are interested, there's a terrific book written by Garrett called Convicting the Innocent, published 2011, that I'd recommend. Well, so it's very important then to know, could we distinguish? Could we have, if we could have, put, if we could have tested those eyewitnesses with a reliable technique, could we have figured out whether they had a true or false memory? In 2009, Loftus and Bernstein, Bernstein and Loftus, uh, published a, a nice review in Perspectives on Psychological Science, focusing mainly on cognitive studies on this topic. And they concluded, and I agree with their conclusion, that, and I've quoted it here, uh, it might be virtually impossible to tell reliably if a particular memory is true or false without independent corroboration. So certainly, cognitive analyses have shown some differences on average between true and false memories, and I'll talk about one of those in a minute, uh, but they concluded, and I would agree, that in the case of any one particular memory, we don't have a reliable way of saying, yes, that's a true memory, yes, that's a false memory. So naturally, uh, it would be very uh, helpful if some of our modern neuroimaging techniques, for example, uh, where we can scan the brain and look at memory, uh, could solve this problem for us. In fact, there was a, a, sort of a very forward-looking and interesting novel written back in the late 90s. It's called The Truth Machine, uh, written by James Halperin. Halperin, and he envisaged a world where neuroimaging technology had advanced to the point where it could, uh, w uh, with very high degree of accuracy, uh, tell if somebody was uh, telling the truth or in intentionally lying, distinguish between a true and false memory. In Halperin's novel, politicians have to wear a scanner when they go on TV and talk to the public, and it will give them away if they're not telling the truth. So we could use that for a certain New York real estate tycoon who is running for president in the U.S. nowadays. Uh, but we don't, we don't currently have that technology. Nonetheless, even though we haven't uh, advanced yet to the world envisaged by Halperin, there are claims out there that might, would lead you to think that we had. So, for example, there's a company called No Lie, FMRI, uh, no Lie MRI, and you can go to their webpage and see this, that uh, they claim to provide unbiased methods for detection of deception and other information stored in the brain, and they're not shy about the claims that they make. So they say the technology used by No Lie MRI represents the first and only direct measure of truth verification and lie detection in human history. That's a big claim. And they show some differences between intentional deception and truth-telling uh, in uh, imaging studies. So I think most people in the field would agree that this goes well beyond, uh, in fact, what the state of the scientific literature uh, would support. But what I want to do now is walk you through a, 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 a few studies um, on neuroimaging of uh, true and false memories, misattribution memory errors that we've carried out over the last few years uh, and, and others uh, as well, and then come back to this issue of uh, can, or have we advanced to the point where even though we can't make this kind of a claim that we're really ready to go into the courtroom and distinguish between true and false memories on the basis of brain activation patterns. So back about 20 years ago, many, many of you know, a very uh, useful paradigm was introduced to the literature by Rodiger and McDermott based on earlier work from Deese in, in the late 50s, now known as the deese rodiger mcdermott paradigm. And this has become one of the standard paradigms for inducing false memories, misattribution errors in the laboratory. Um, so in this kind of, uh, in the standard DRM paradigm, participants study semantic associates of a word that never appears on the study list. All these associates converge on a non-presented theme word. So you might hear a list, and many of you are familiar with this and have even done work on this, uh, like candy, sour, sugar, bitter, good taste, tooth, nice, honey, soda, chocolate, heart, cake, eat, pie. So you hear all those associated words. I give you a memory test. I ask you, was taste on the list? And you say, yeah, it was on the list, and it was. Uh, I can throw in an unrelated word that was not presented, such as point, and you would have an easy time saying, no, that wasn't on the list. But the interesting effect here uh, comes with the associatively uh, related theme word, uh, critical lure word, it's sometimes called sweet. Sweet is the word that's related to all those words that were presented, although it never appeared. And the interesting phenomenon is that people 
will claim very often and with high confidence that sweet was on the list even though it was not. Uh, so these are some early data from a behavioral study in my lab that was done by Ken Norman when he was a graduate student with me many years ago, uh, comparing uh, college students and older adults in the DRM paradigm. They've heard a bunch of these DRM lists, and what I'm showing you here are the proportion of times on the memory test that they'll make an old response, they'll claim a word was on the list. And you can see for the true targets, about 80% of the time, both young and old subjects will say a word like taste was on the list and it actually was, that's a hit. But the interesting effects here come from the false targets, the related lure words, where about 75% of the time for young and even a higher proportion of times for the older adults, they claimed that sweet was on the list. So it's a very powerful memory illusion. If you look at the false alarm rate to an unrelated word that has nothing to do with any of the words that was presented, it's down around 15%. So you're going from 15% for unrelated false alarms up to over 80%, very powerful. So when you've got a strong false memory effect like that, that puts you in a position where you start asking the question, can we tell the difference in brain activity between brain activity underlying a true memory in this paradigm and a false memory. And so back in, uh, shortly after that paradigm came out, we conducted then a PET study, positron emission tomography uh, study, where people heard a bunch of these DRM lists and then they were scanned uh, and we compared brain activity for true and false memories. And one striking finding from that early paper was that there was a lot of overlap a lot of the same brain areas activated to a similar degree when people remembered accurately a word that they had heard and falsely remembered the critical lure word that they thought they had heard but they hadn't. But we found some differences between true and false recognition. This was uh, published way back in 1996. Uh, and one of the notable findings that there was a, a, an area of uh, the left middle temporal uh, gyrus and a little bit on the right showed increased activity uh, during true memory uh, compared to both a baseline control condition, one side of the slide, and compared to false memory. And this is a region that had been implicated, has been implicated in auditory processing, and the idea was, well, maybe that at increased act activity related to the word you actually heard reflects some kind of lingering auditory uh, reactivation. Uh, that effect was uh, replicated in a later study by Abe et al. with a completely uh, different sample. They found uh, a few different regions that showed increased activity for true versus false uh, recognition, including the, the left, uh, left temporal region uh, that we had seen and offered a similar interpretation. And what we and they and others had suggested uh, along the lines that I just mentioned briefly is that what we might be seeing here is uh, evidence for some kind of sensory reactivation effect. And indeed, indeed, er earlier studies in the, false m in the false memory behavioral literature, the pre-scanning literature, had suggested that true memories are characterized by uh, greater access to sensory perceptual details than false memories are, and this may reflect reactivation of sensory perceptual encoding operations for previously experienced events that don't exist or don't exist to the same extent for these events that never occurred. And there's behavioral evidence on that point from post-information, uh, po uh, post-event misinformation effects going back to the 80s, Jonathan Schooler and colleagues. And then from the Norman study and uh, other studies uh, with DRM, there's even some evidence that when you remember one of the words that really was on the list, you at least subjectively rate the, for example, the auditory detail as higher than for the false memory. Well, following up on that line, in uh, subsequent work uh, with Scott Slotnick, uh, published in 2004, we did a study that looked at evidence for sensory reactivation in the visual domain. So this is a fMRI experiment, and it used kind of a visual analog of the DRM paradigm. Now people were shown a series of uh, abstract, novel abstract shapes. So shapes like those uh, shown under uh, the heading of the exemplars. So they'd see nine of uh, shapes that kind of looked alike, uh, looked like one another, and they were all variations on what's labeled in the slide the non-studied prototype. 
So uh, they're all variations on that prototype. So the subjects never see the prototype. They see a lot of the shapes that look like the prototype. And behavioral testing shows that, well, they have a, a, a pretty good hit rate for the shapes that they actually saw. They have a very high false alarm rate for the prototypes. So they'll claim that the, the uh, shape on the left was on the list. It looks a lot like the shapes that were on the list, but it wasn't really there. And it's similar, it's like a visual analog to the DRM kind of paradigm. But the question here is, would there be any evidence of uh, sensory reactivation in visual processing areas, with the idea being that for the shapes you actually saw, there might be some persisting record of visual information that wouldn't be there to the same extent for the related shapes that you think you saw, but you didn't see. And once again, there are lots of analyses in this study. I'm just going to show you one. Uh, it was very striking that on the one hand, true and false recognition uh, elicited many of the same brain regions, regions that previously we knew activate during episodic memory tasks. But there, again, there were differences. And one of the most interesting ones was a difference in an early, early visual regions in Broadens area 17 and 18 that showed increased activity at the time of test when people, uh, when people responded with a true memory for a shape they had actually seen versus a false memory where they claimed that they saw a shape but they hadn't really seen it. Uh, under those conditions, there was more activity in, in these early uh, visual regions consistent with the sensory reactivation idea. Uh, since that time, there have been other, uh, many other studies that have looked at this. Uh, so, for example, uh, Stark uh, uh, and Loftus and their colleagues uh, did a misinformation study uh, using the classic Loftus misinformation paradigm to uh, elicit post-event false memories. And they found something similar to what we found in the, in the Slotnik study, uh, in increased activity for true greater than false memories uh, in early visual regions. Um, and it was uh, an experiment using visual uh, testing materials. Uh, some work from my lab with Scott Guerin, we used a slightly different kind of paradigm. We were interested in trying to distinguish between the recovery of specific episodic details about a visual object on the one hand versus just paying attention to that object and carefully inspecting it during retrieval. And I. I don't have time to go into details of that study. It was published a couple of years ago, uh, but it provided some evidence for increased true greater than false activity in the inferior parietal lobule, a, a region other studies have linked to retrieval of episodic detail, and other studies have made similar points. Uh, what I would summarize uh, this work as, as showing uh, over the last 20 years is that I think it's fair to say that pretty much anybody who's done a fMRI study of true versus false memory has found some, some evidence uh, that brain activity can distinguish uh, true versus false memories in a range of paradigms. I think the effects are broadly consistent with the sensory reactivation hypothesis, but importantly, the specific regions that show this difference can vary depending on materials, tasks, and other experimental details. In other words, there's no one truth detection region or anything like that uh, that this research has yielded. It's very much paradigm and task uh, dependent. Recently, there's a nice meta-analysis of uh, neural activity associated with false memory retrieval published in Neuropsychologia by uh, Kirkella and, and uh, Nancy Dennis, who's been active in that area. They didn't focus so much on the true greater than false contrast that I've been talking about. They were interested in the question of can you identify reliably regions that are associated with false memory uh, retrieval, and they claim that there are some regions uh, shown in a uh, figure taken from their slide. You can't not be able to see too much there, but these regions included medial uh, superior frontal gyrus, left precentral gyrus, left inferior parietal cortex that showed uh, activity associated with false memory retrieval. These regions showed it across paradigms and tasks, but other regions showed very paradigm-specific and material-specific uh, effects. So um, on the one hand, we are, uh, we are making progress in this area. We're starting to identify some of the differences between true and false memory, and we are starting to learn about regions that are consistently associated with false memory. 
But where does that leave us with respect to these? I'll mention a couple of them there that we think uh, require caution in, in going from the kinds of results I've talked about in other studies to trying to apply this as, as it's badly needed in courtroom cases. Uh, so for one, uh, we're, most of these experiments have used highly constrained and artificial materials versus rich in the lab versus rich autobiographical memories uh, in the real world. That's starting to change, and I'll talk about some relevant work in a minute. Um, there's typically a very short delay between encoding and retrieval in lab studies of true versus false memory. In the real world, we may be trying to figure out whether a memory is true or false months or years after the event occurred. We have no idea whether we can make these distinctions over those long delays. The target populations, most of these lab studies I've talked about, use undergraduates or, or healthy, uh, high-functioning young subjects. We have much more diverse populations who are encountered in the courtroom. And finally, the whole issue of averaging in the studies I've talked about and still nowadays most uh, fMRI studies we're averaging across subjects in groups. Of course, in the courtroom, we need to know about individuals. Now, progress has been made using uh, pattern classifiers in uh, being able to look at brain activity in individuals. We don't always have to rely on group averages, but most of the true-false memory studies still uh, follow that pattern. And in the lab, again, we're looking at collections of items of events. We're averaging across many items, whereas in the courtroom, we just need one person, one event. Now, there are some studies that are showing we can measure brain activity for one person, one event, but we're still not at the point where we can say that we can make these kinds of distinctions under those very stringent conditions. Okay, so let me go to uh, part two of the talk. And here I want to just tell you about a little bit of uh, recent work in the lab that's actually related to what I just talked about uh, where we've been interested in misattribution errors that result from retrieving or reactivating a memory. So we know that when we reactivate a memory, it's not just taking something out of the file drawer and putting it back. It has consequences for that memory. So reactivation can affect subsequent memory in various ways. Uh, we know that it can increase subsequent memory, the well-known phenomenon of the testing effect. When you test memory, it's not a, just a neutral event. It can boost subsequent memory. But we also know that when you reactivate a past experience, it can bring a memory into a labile or unstable state where that memory is prone to various kinds of modifications. Uh, often referred to as reconsolidation. And there's a nice review by Hard and Karim Nader and their group that relates this reconsolidation phenomena to memory distortion and constructive memory published a few years back in the annual review of uh, uh, psychology. Uh, but little is known about how the properties or qualities of reactivating a memory actually impact subsequent true and false memories. So I want to tell you about two studies that were done by Peggy St. Jacques when she was a postdoc in my lab, is now a faculty member at the University of Sussex uh, in England, that used a more of a real world memory paradigm, trying to break away from word lists and lists of pictures and so forth to look at how reactivating a memory can impact subsequent true and false, uh, false, rec uh, false memory. So this was a study where uh, participants went on guided tours of two museums that are right near my office in the, uh, my lab in the Harvard Psychology Department, uh, the Harvard Museum of Natural History and the Peabody Museum. Uh, the tours guided them to view some items in, in each exhibit and not others. So they went through 32 different exhibits and the, the tour guide, uh, the, the, it, they were on their own, but the sort of the tour map would tell them, you look at this and you look at this, but don't look at these other things. So they're going to look at some things within a particular exhibit, not going to look at others. How do we know what they're looking at? Well, they wore uh, what's now known as a Vicon review camera. Many of you are familiar with that. It takes photos every 15 seconds, so they're wearing that around their neck as they go through the tour, and that is going to allow us to confirm later on that they actually went where we said and didn't go where we didn't want them to go. So this is what the 
pictures look like. It's kind of a fisheye look out of that camera that's taking pictures 15 seconds of every 15 seconds of their tour. So after they do the tour, they come back uh, two days later, they come back to the memory lab for the reactivation section. We try to reactivate their memories of what happened during that tour. And to do that, they viewed uh, what was uh, called in the study an event movie, and that consists of photos of uh, exhibit items uh, they had seen on the tour, and we're going to vary how that event movie is played to the people. And critically, when they see the event movie, they see little, uh, uh, they see pictures of what they experienced during the tour, they're going to make a judgment about a related item that was in the exhibit, but they didn't see it. And they're going to judge how related is this item to the other items that you did see. So we're going to try to slip in a false memory, as it were. And critically now, the properties of reactivation are manipulated. We're going to use a couple of experimental procedures to try to get a relatively stronger reactivation of the original experience or a relatively weaker one and see how that impacts subsequent true and false memory. And then two days after that reactivation section, they come back to the lab and they're given a memory test uh, asking them about items from the tour, the, uh, the reactivation session, and completely new baseline items. So the items from the tour, those are the old items. The items in the reactivation session, we slip in some new ones, and we're going to see, are they going to claim that they were part of the original tour? And then we throw in some novel baseline items. OK. Um, so here's the critical manip manipulation, and it was, it was called reactivation match versus mismatch. So there are two experiments here. In the first experiment, in both experiments, the reactivation match condition is one in which they see four photos on the top, and in experiment one, they're, they're in the exact order in which the subjects actually experience them in the tour. So that's uh, sort of matching their original experience now. You show them that event movie. So they see those items uh, in the exact order they saw them before, and then you slip in that related item. That was part of the exhibit, but they never saw it. And you just ask them to make a judgment of how related that is to the other items. In the reactivation mismatch condition, the temporal order is juggled a little bit. So we know from earlier studies that when you show people events and you, in, in a different temporal order than they originally experienced them, their memory is not quite as vivid or not quite as strong. So that was the idea behind the reactivation mismatch. You can see the last two items are, are out of order, and they make a relatedness judgment. So that's experiment one. Experiment two, it's the same idea, except that you have reactivation match as before. In the reactivation mismatch at the bottom, the mismatch is achieved by a perspective manipulation. So now they see those photos, uh, but from a very different perspective than they actually experience them. So the idea is that in reactivation match, you get a very strong, uh, vivid re-experiencing of the event, and in the reactivation mismatch, less so. It's less of a strong uh, reactivation. And in the uh, second experiment, they make, in fact, make ratings of how strongly they feel that they're reliving the original event. And then we can see uh, what happens uh, when they take a, a, a test later on. And so here's what happens. Um, what I'm showing you here are our results for, for hits and false alarms where we've subtracted out uh, appropriate baselines. So don't worry too much about the absolute numbers. The critical finding, experiment one is on the left, if you look at the hit rate, the red bar is higher than the blue bar. That means that there are more hits uh, in the reactivation match than mismatch condition. That's kind of what you'd expect. They had a stronger reactivation of the original experience, so two days later, they have more memories for the original event. They're more accurate. But the interesting finding is that the false alarm rate is also higher for the mass match than the mismatch condition. So when you strongly reactivate your memory for the original event and you make that judgment, is that new item related, it kind of gets pulled into the memory a little bit more than when there's a weaker reactivation and you have a false memory misattribution later on. On the right, uh, show, shows the data from the second experiment and now it's uh, split according to high and low reliving ratings, uh, ratings, that's a median split for whether 
people when they were making the, the rating during the reactivation, reactivation session, how strongly do you feel that you're reliving the original experience? And what you can see, it's in the high, for the high reliving ratings is where you get this effect of the reactivation match producing a higher false alarm rate than the reactivation mismatch. So when you have this strong reliving and the reactivation condition during the test matches your original memory, uh, that is more likely to result in a false memory later on, two days later, you're going to claim that that related lure was part of the original tour. You're more likely to do that when you've had more of a, a strong uh, sense of, of reactivation. And we later went on uh, and, and did a, a PEG, uh, Peggy went on and did a, pe uh, a scanning study where the idea was uh, to look at uh, uh, these effects in terms of uh, brain areas, uh, brain areas known to be related to memory retrieval. So we know from many studies of autobiographical memory retrieval um, that uh, there's a, a network of regions that's part of the default network that comes online when we, we, we retrieve autobiographical memories. And a few of these regions in several studies have been re previously related to react what I'm going to call reactivation quality, including the medial temporal lobe, retrosplenial, and posterior parietal cortices. The, the, they tend to show increased uh, activity related to uh, uh, increased quality of reactivation or retrieval, or more detail, if you will. And so the prediction for the fMRI study was that these reactivation-related effects on subsequent true and false memory that I just told you about from the behavioral study where more strongly reactivated items produce more subsequent true and false memories, that that effect might be mediated by these regions in the autobiographical memory network, default network, uh, that have been related to reactivation quality. So the prediction would be that there should be increased activity in these regions during the reactivation phase for old events and related new events that are subsequently remembered as old, uh, hits and uh, false alarms, uh, um, respectively. So more activation in these regions should predict both that you're going to get a hit on an old item later on that was actually in the tour, but they should also predict that you're going to false alarm to the related item that is more strongly reactivated using a subsequent memory approach that uh, um, some of you be, will be familiar with. So I'm going to skip over all the details of the study and basically just publish the 2013, uh, show you that indeed uh, the main prediction was borne out that common subsequent memory effects were observed in those three critical regions in the autobiographical memory network. More activity in those regions was predictive of later on a true memory for an event from the tour, but also the reactivated false memory. And those regions all modulated with uh, reliving ratings. So to conclude then uh, on uh, that section, uh, we've seen some evidence that quality of reactivation modulates these subsequent memory effects and reactivation-related enhancement and distortion is associated with neural recruitment in regions sensitive to the quality of reactivation. And the last line is an important one. We discussed this in, in, in the paper. The idea that what we're seeing here as a memory misattribution error, the false memory for the related lure produced by a strong reactivation of what happened might also be a sign basically of an adaptive memory process, a process of updating memory that is often a good thing. You want to update memory to include the most recent information, but in this case introduces an item that wasn't actually part of the tour, but it's something you're considering when you're reflecting back on the tour and it kind of gets sucked into that original memory. Okay, so in the last part of the talk, I want to now focus on the question or the issue of misattribution and adaptive memory processes. And that was really hinted at in the discussion of the, uh, the Saint-Jacques papers where we tried to make the argument that the, the reactivation-related error may reflect maybe part and parcel of kind of a memory updating process that can sometimes get you into trouble. 
So as I mentioned earlier, um, when I wrote about the seven sins in, in, uh, back in 99 and 2001, I concluded the, the American Psychologist article and, also, and, then, and then the book with a long discussion of the question, are these seven sins really sins? And the answer is no, they're probably not really sins. They are features of memory that are byproducts of processes that mostly help the system to work well, but have costs associated with them. Perhaps the simplest, the clearest, most intuitive example of that idea might be persistence, unwanted recollections that people can't forget. Um, those kinds of intrusive recollections can be quite disabling, associated with PTSD and other very maladaptive features. On the one hand, so that's a, that's a bad thing. On the other hand, we want a memory system that is going to preserve in a very strong way uh, information that could be potentially threatening to our survival. And our memory system, through the action of the amygdala and other regions uh, uh, associated with emotion, uh, works that way. We do tend to have very strong memories of emotional experiences that can help us to avoid future threat, but there's a downside. And uh, from this perspective, the downside would be uh, persistence. So I tried to make that argument for each of the seven sins. I won't go through that, all that now, but let's talk about uh, misattribution. So back in 99 and 2001, uh, the argument I made was that many misattributions occur because we typically don't need to remember every detail of every experience. We wouldn't really want to have a memory system uh, that records every trivial detail. Often we're better off remembering the gist and that can be a good thing because it promotes the retention of meaning and the general themes of experience, but a gist-only memory can set the stage for memory misattribution errors. So that's one way of looking at it. Uh, what I want to finish up with is talking about uh, some more recent developments. Now, for, first I'll mention, I won't have time to go into, that there, since the publication of the Seven Sins stuff, there has been new evidence for an adaptive view of misattribution, and uh, Scott Guerin and Peggy St. Jacques and I discussed some of that, that evidence in a Tix article in 2011, um, and I'm just going to talk about one subset of what we discussed in the uh, Tix article, and that relates to the whole issue of imagination and memory. Now, we know that imagination can be a potent source of false memories. It's the classic work of Mar Marsha Johnson, how re reality monitoring confusions exist for perceived versus imagined events. There's the more recent work of Elizabeth Loftus and others on imagination inflation and rich false memories. You imagine something that might have happened to you when, when you were a child and you then develop a false memory for that experience. A very striking paper by Sean Porter, Psych Science 2015, showing how with imagination and social suggestion, you can get upwards of 70% of undergraduates to develop a false memory that they committed a crime when they were 12 years old. Very striking. So we know that imagination can be a potent source of false memories. Well, from an adaptive perspective, I'd argue that one of the interesting things that we've learned over the past few years that can help put this in a slightly different perspective is that imagination and memory rely on many of the same brain regions. So there's a whole line of work that we've been involved in, Eleanor McGuire and others have been heavily involved in, uh, that has shown when, for example, you put people in the scanner and you ask them to remember past experiences and imagine future experiences, you're going to see a lot of common activity. Back in 2007, Donna Addis, Randy Buckner, and I uh, talked about a core network, which is largely overlaps with the default network and includes the autobiographical memory network that I talked about earlier, that's involved in remembering past events, imagining future events, and supporting related kinds of mental simulations. Uh, Roland Benoit, uh, postdoc uh, in my lab, led a, a meta-analysis that we published last year uh, that largely supports what we we're saying back in 2007. So with respect to imagination and false memory, if imagination and real memories are largely drawn on some of the same regions, maybe this gives us some insight into why they can be so easily confused. Well, what is the adaptive value of such an arrangement? Well, Donna Addis and I, around that same time, 2007, when we started working on uh, future thinking and imagination as it relates to memory, 
put forth an idea that we call the constructive episodic simulation hypothesis. And the, the gist of that idea is that episodic memory, which people have traditionally associated with recollection of past personal experiences, but Endel Tolving, of course, extended to future thinking um, many years ago, uh, we agreed with Tolving and argued that uh, episodic memory plays a, a key role in imagining possible future scenarios and, and other kinds of scenarios, what we refer to as episodic simulation. And the critical idea here is that episodic memory is supporting kind of a flexible re retrieval and recombination process whereby we can take elements of stored episodes to construct new possible future episodes. So that's a, a good thing about having a flexible memory system. You're not just wedded to strictly using it to retrieve the past in literal form. You can retrieve and recombine, put together novel scenarios and project into the future about what might happen. So that's a good thing. But the potential downside, we argued, was that this flexibility, though adaptive when you're trying to uh, use memory to imagine future and other kinds of hypothetical experiences, can also result in memory errors when ele elements of past experience are miscombined. So that flexible memory system can be a good thing, but as we saw in the Oklahoma City bombing case, uh, maybe that same flexible memory system can lead you to miscombine elements of past experiences into uh, events that never happened. So the last thing I want to tell you about is some very recent work, not published uh, yet, that uh, looks at a prediction made by the constructive uh, episodic simulation hypothesis, namely that flexible retrieval and recombination processes can produce memory distortions. That's an essential part of the idea. We haven't really focused on it uh, in our research yet. It's sort of been uh, asserted as an interesting possible idea. So I'll tell you about some recent work where we adapted a transitive inference problem to look at this issue of the relationship between flexible retrieval recombination on the one hand, false memory on the other. Okay, transitive inference and flexible retrieval. So we know that we can learn about the relationship between bits of information from different episodes that we've experienced and make inferences based on combining information across those episodes forming novel associations. Uh, for example, you might learn that item A is directly related to item B. You might learn that, that explicitly, because you experienced item uh, uh, A and B together. Then you might also experience item C and B together, learn that they're related. But then later on, you can make an inference that A and C are somehow linked through their common association with B. And there's been a lot of work on this kind of task dating to Howard Eichenbaum and others. The hippocampus seems to play a role in it. Daphne Shohami and Anthony Wagner, Preston Zaitamova have been very active uh, in this area. So to make this concrete and to preview an example, uh, uh, an example from the experiment I'm going to show you, uh, for example, you could see a, a picture of this guy holding uh, a toy uh, dump truck in a particular setting. We're going to call that AB. You're learning that those two things go together. Then you could see a picture of this little kid with that same toy uh, dump truck in a different setting. That's the BC. Those two things go together. So you've learned that those two things go together. And having those direct relationships uh, learned, you can reactivate and recombine information about the direct relationships to infer that A is related to C, even though A and C have never been paired. But you can make that inference. There's something in common between these, these two things. OK. So there are two, in the literature, there are two thoughts about mechanisms of this transit, transitive inference process. How does this actually work? When does it happen that you make the inference? The first is called integrative encoding. So when BC is presented, uh, AB is reactivated and the AB link is inferred so that you form an explicit ABC unit. Okay, so when I presented that second slide, you know, I said, oh, I remember seeing that guy with that same dump truck, and you fuse them together then. It's called integrative encoding. Second mechanism I'm going to refer to as flexible retrieval. That is, during the inference test, when I ask you later on, are 
these, are this guy and this little boy, are they related, which they were through the dump truck, at that moment, through flexible retrieval, you bring the two things to mind, combine that, and combine the previously studied B, A, B, and B, C pairs. So there's evidence for both mechanism, mechanisms in the literature, but in this experiment I'm going to tell you about, we're going to try to isolate the observed effects to the flexible retrieval as opposed to integrative uh, encoding. Okay, so the main hypothesis is that the capacity for flexible retrieval and recombination can support inference across overlapping events, but it may also leave memory prone to error distortion, such as source misattributions, where details of a secondary overlapping event are mistakenly attributed to memory for the original events. So the idea is that in the course of successfully inferring the link between these two episodes, that might also produce as a byproduct a source memory error where you're gonna fuse those episodes when you make the correct inference in a way that leads you to have a source memory error. I'll show you exactly how we, how we do that in a minute. So I'm gonna tell you about two experiments. They're variations on a theme using uh, this kind of A, B, B, C transitive inference, inference paradigm to test the hypothesis that the flexible re rec retrieval recombination process that supports successful inference also produces source misattribution errors. This is work led in the lab by Alexis Carpenter, graduate student in the lab. Uh, uh, work is still in, in preparation. Uh, so here's the, here's the overview. Uh, there are two sessions that are separated by a 24-hour delay. It's young adult subjects. The first session they come in and they do A, B, and B, C encoding. So they're gonna see those, I'm gonna show you the pictures again. The pictures like the, the guy with the dump truck and the boy with the dump truck in a setting. So in the first session, the participants uh, viewed two blocks of 24 critical images. The first set consists of the A, B, the guy with the dump truck, the, uh, with, with the dump truck, and the second B, C, the little boy with the dump truck. Ten, presented for 10 seconds each. And they appear uh, superimposed on backgrounds, as I showed you uh, before. So again, this would be an A-B encoding item. So you're trying to remember that these two things go together. And you're learning, you're seeing it in particular context. Then after you've seen a bunch of items of that kind, you do B-C encoding, and you see some of those uh, same objects paired with a different person. That's the B-C. Now, during the encoding phase, the participants are told they'd be later tested on both the directly learned items and also the indirect learning, indirectly learned pairs, and that was following a procedure from Preston's lab. So they kind of know what's up. They're trying to learn the AB, they're trying to learn the AC, and they know they may be asked about the AB, BC items, and also about the link. They know that, and that's been done in the literature previously. Now here's the critical part. In session two, they come back and they get some multiple choice and source questions, about half of the studied items. Then they get the directly learned and inference test, and then they're gonna get tests on another half of the items. So they come in, they get a multiple choice source test, and they're asked what color was the couch? Now, the correct answer for that is white. The guy was in there with a white couch, right? And here, uh, the couch was brown. So it would be a mistake if you said for that guy that the couch was brown. That would be an error, right? So white is the right answer, and brown is the misinformation answer. If you choose brown, you're on your way to a, a false memory in this paradigm. You haven't quite gotten there yet, but you're on your way. Where do you remember seeing this information? So if you now claim that that brown couch was either in the first set of images or in both, now you've got a certified false memory. Because you're, you're claiming that it was a brown couch with that guy, and it wasn't, it was a white couch, and you're claiming that it happened, uh, that you saw that brown couch in either the first or both. You didn't, you only saw it in the second. So now you've got a false memory. So after the first half of these trials, then participants get the standard directly learn and inference 
trials. On each trial, they see a queue uh, of an individual at the top of the screen. They're asked to make a two alternative force choice judgment, selecting the correct association. So now we're going to say, who was this, what object uh, uh, was this guy paired with? So for the directly learned trials, you should choose the dump truck, because that's, you saw the guy with the dump truck. You also saw that other truck, but wasn't paired with that guy. So for the directly learned trials, that would be the correct answer. Now the critical thing is the inference trials, okay? You haven't seen those two get together, but if you make the correct inference, you should choose that little boy and not that little boy as being related to this guy because they both had the truck, right? So that would be a correct answer on the inference test. So now you get, you're tested for all the items in inference. This is important. And then you get the other half of the items for the multiple choice and source monitoring. So again, half the items for source monitoring, all the items for inference, the other half of the items for source monitoring. Let's walk through the hypothesis, uh, hypotheses here. I, the experiment is a little complex, but I want to walk you through it step by step. So flexible retrieval leading to successful inference also increases susceptibility to false memory, then the proportion of source misattributions should be higher when you get it right on the inference test. So it's a little counterintuitive, but you should make more false memories when you make, get the inference right then when you get the inference wrong, and that should only happen when the detailed source test is given after the associate inference test, because you just had the inference test. So it's the flexible retrieval that's causing the false memory. You should only see this pattern after you've had a test of direct and indirectly learned associations. If integrative encoding leads to successful inference, uh, leading to successful inference also increases susceptibility to false memories, then the proportion of source misattribution should be higher for correct and inf incorrect inference, but both before and after. So if the integrative encoding, thinking of the first guy, when you see the, 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 the little boy in the truck, you say, oh, that reminds me, if that's the responsible process, then you should see a boost in false memories both before, for items tested before and after the inference test. That would suggest it doesn't really have anything to do with recombination during the inference test. And if there's no relationship between successful inference and false memories, then there shouldn't be any differences in source misattributions for correct and correct inference at all. So it's only this first pattern that would be consistent with the hypothesis. Here's what happens. I'm plotting the proportion of false memories. When you get the detail wrong and you misattribute it to the wrong episode, you claim it was a brown couch with a man and that was in the first set of trials. That's a false memory. Well, if you look at those trials where you're, you get the inference wrong, there's no difference in false memories before and after the inference test. When you make the incorrect inference. However, when you get the inference right, there is an increase in false memories, but it's only after you just had the inference test. So it's something about pulling together those items on the inference test specifically and getting it right that fuses the items in a way that boosts the false memory rate. And then we did a second experiment basically with a few different minor details in procedure. It's basically the same thing. We ask the questions a little bit differently, and it is the same outcome. There's a boost in false memories for successful, cor for correct inferences, but only after the inference test, not before. That all seems to be pointing in the direction of a flexible retrieval effect. We've actually done two more experiments, just with varying the delay and where we uh, took out the directly learned items on the test just to be only using the inference items on the test, we get the exact same result. So we've gotten the same result four times, four different experiments, and basically what it suggests is that recombination during retrieval that is required for successful inference, 
That's a good thing, allows you to make the inference, it also gets you into trouble. That successful inference when you're recombining the information uh, at retrieval can lead to source memory error. Okay, so then just to summarize, there are three main parts to the talk. We reviewed evidence on misattribution of the brain and saw that we can distinguish true versus false memories, but we really can't do so in a way that's appropriate for the courtroom. We talked about misattribution and memory reactivation. We saw that the reactivation process can boost tr subsequent true memories. It can also boost subsequent false memories. And then we talked about misattribution and adaptive memory processes. And uh, we saw that flexible retrieval and recombination, we think that that's a good thing for episodic simulation, using memory to imagine future and hypothetical experiences. But that very flexibility in a transitive, transitive inference paradigm is responsible for false memories. So broadly consistent with this adaptive perspective. I want to thank my collaborators, my lab, my funding sources, and thank you for your attention.